uh, has finally arrived, and Professor Kita uh, is here, directly from France, and he will give us our, uh, his uh, take on, uh, on the anthropology of politics in the 21st century. Okay, well, Mao gave me what I thought was an even more uh, powerful title, which was what would an engaged anthropology look like in the 21st century? So I'll try and speak to that question. I mean, I, the, 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 the background is that, uh, I mean, if, you, if I locate myself in a process of politics and intellectual life, um, I would say that I'm taking part in a, a, the long human conversation uh, about a better world. And uh, this is a, a conversation lasting thousands of years in which uh, 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 there are some very prominent contributors. And one can never know one's own relationship to this, probably as a very minor bit player, but you never know. You can always hope. And uh, 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 so, so, and in this conversation about a better world, uh, I believe that anthropology has already played a part, but that it will play an even greater part in the future. In other words, I believe that anthropology's future is potentially more significant than its past. And I therefore seek to locate the, a vision of that future in the conditions uh, that we confront today in the world and in the light of uh, our experience of the last half century or more, which in my case is my lifetime, uh, in yours uh, is probably already ancient history. So uh, I want to start then, as I usually do, by placing this moment and the possibilities for anthropology in uh, a historical framework. I mean, I can't imagine answering this question except as a historical proposition. And so if we ask what modern anthropology has been, its uh, origins in the 18th century were as part of the political and philosophical movement to install uh, democratic societies on the basis of what we sometimes call the old regime uh, an extremely unequal form of society, which was based on arbitrary rule by landlords, often conquerors of a territory. And uh, the Enlightenment and liberal politics of the, of the 18th century were uh, uh, concerned with the, the question of uh, what would it take, what kind of knowledge would it take for us to institute societies in which people, rather than uh, arbitrary elites, uh, determine uh, the outcome of society's preferences. And in order to pursue that question, they constructed a notion that they call human nature. They wanted to know if existing societies are essentially arbitrary, they're based on huge class differences whose historical origins have no justification, uh, what would be the basis for building a polity in which everyone had the same rights and uh, political potential? And that they felt, uh, and it's obvious uh, the answer, they felt that uh, 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 they had to find out what it was that human beings had in common so that you could build uh, new democratic constitutions on that presumption of what were uh, essentially the natural attributes of all human beings. Uh, so uh, anthropology started out then in that context, in the hands of writers such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and uh, uh, ultimately uh, Immanuel Kant, who developed the, the most uh, advanced version of this project and whose book uh, was the first to use the term anthropology, he wrote a book and published it in the 1790s called Anthropology from a Pragmatic Point of View, which was intended to be a popular text, a uh, guide to life, if you like. And these uh, liberal philosophers uh, essentially constructed models of uh, society based on an anthropology, an assumption 
supported by the knowledge that was available in the day, the reports of James Cook on the Pacific, the uh, reports that were coming out of North America on the Native Americans and so on, as well as on speculative philosophy and psychology and so forth. And they built this uh, notion of what humanity might be at base uh, uh, as a means of, if you like, giving some intellectual foundation for the political revolution that they supported and which was manifested in this period as the English, French, American, and Italian revolutions. So uh, uh, for me, uh, this origin of anthropology in a revolutionary politics, a democratic revolutionary politics, uh, is, uh, will be its, uh, its future also. I mean, I look to this period uh, of its formation as uh, a source of inspiration for what it might become. But in the two centuries since then, anthropology has um, uh, departed quite significantly from uh, its mission to be a democratic uh, revolutionary ideology uh, or branch of knowledge. In the 19th century, as you know, uh, anthropology became something else. It was in the court, after the Industrial Revolution, the West took control of the planet very rapidly and relatively easily, par as partly as a result of their economic strength, but also the machines that they commanded, not least uh, transport and uh, machines of death. And, and so uh, this quick takeover of the world, I mean, in 1900, uh, 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 something like... Uh, 80 or 90 percent of the land surface of the planet was controlled by people of European origin. So, uh, and that was a very much smaller proportion, uh, of course, at the beginning of the 19th century. So anthropology in the 19th century was less a revolutionary project and more an attempt to explain how this came about. How was it that a few people from Europe uh, were able to take over the world almost without any effective resistance, so quickly and so totally. And of course, they, uh, they found their answer in the notion that, well, it must, we must be smarter than them. I mean, we must have something uh, that they haven't got. I mean, we've got science and they've got superstition or magic or myth or, or religion or something. So the, the first stage of an answer was, uh, uh, um, the first stage of an answer uh, was that uh, we have some form of cultural superiority uh, which had to be explained and elucidated. But then before long, this notion of a superior culture was allied to uh, a notion of uh, biological difference. That is to say, they recognized that the new uh, world society that they had created uh, uh, consisted of white, brown, yellow, and black people arranged uh, in an order that seemed to be a hierarchy based on race. So they linked this idea of cultural superiority to the idea of racial difference. And they understood, obviously, that the world was in movement, and so their key idea was one of evolution, that that, that, that we're living in a world of change. They understood that, but they also uh, sought to rationalize as more or less permanent Western dominance of that changing global structure. So in the 19th century, anthropology was an attempt to explain the origins and movement of the racial hierarchy that Victorians found in the world, okay? Now this model was rejected at the beginning of the 20th century, and the form of anthropology that you're more familiar with, which developed then, uh, 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 was based largely on the repudiation of this model. Uh, and of course, we understand it as the ethnographic movement. Now, this ethnographic movement does have profound democratic sources. It's based on the idea that people everywhere uh, uh, have the right to determine their own form of social existence, 
that what matters is less how people we consider as being primitive might offer models of where the advanced civilizations once came from, that what matters is that we should understand how their societies and cultures uh, 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 work for them now. Uh, so it was very much anti-historicist. Uh, it was very much anchored in the present, and it was based on the idea that we can only really find out by joining them where they live and uh, discovering what they think and do uh, through some prolonged exposure to them.